Amen. Well, good morning, church. How are y'all doing this morning? Wonderful. It is so good to see you all here this morning. Welcome to Christ Community Fellowship. If it is your first time joining us for worship this morning, we are so delighted that you joined us this morning. We hope you enjoy and we hope to see you back again. And if you are tuning in with us on the live stream, we are just as excited to have you worship with us this morning as well. My name is Joey Colbert. I'm the student pastor here at CCF, and it is our goal it is our mission, it is our vision as a church to bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by learning from Christ, living in Christ, and leading others to Christ. A couple announcements from the student ministry. One, I want to lift up a shout of praise because Wednesday night we talked about knowing Jesus and knowing Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we gave a gospel presentation. And I know for sure that at least two students ended up getting saved Wednesday night. So that is, that is incredible. Man, we only had two, we had two salvations last year that we celebrated, and now in the first week of January, we've already matched that. So I am, I am beyond excited to see what God is going to do this year. And so students, if you're here and you don't join us on Wednesday nights, uh, 6 o'clock upstairs, we feed you guys, we have Bible study, and then we'll break off into small groups, and we'll talk about the lesson in a little bit more detail. So join us Wednesday night upstairs from 6 to 7. And then finally, also, I need food volunteers. So as I mentioned, right, we feed the youth every Wednesday night, and we've still got a few dates open where we need people to fill uh, to come feed the students. So if you would be interested in that, um, catch me after service. Catch me if you see me walking around, and I will get you a list of the dates available. So if you would like to sign up for one of those, I would greatly appreciate it. And then for the rest, the church announcements. Ms. Lauren? Okay, so the date for the upcoming women's group has been changed to Wednesday, January 18th at 6 p.m. here at CCF. All ages are invited. Sunday morning Bible study is um, here on Sunday mornings at CCF, 9.15 a.m., and I think that's in the front uh, Sunday school classroom. And then finally, fourth and fifth grade Sunday school is on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., and that is with Miss Ashley. Mm -hmm. Yes, with Miss Ashley. That's all I've got. Thank you, Miss Lauren. And also in regards to that women's Bible study, Miss Kathy Phillips wanted to uh, say a few words about that. Good morning. Church, because we are going to study Ecclesiastics, and if anybody has read Ecclesiastics, it is a very interesting book. It's about Solomon. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Can you imagine anybody more busier than Solomon? So we're, as women, we, we run our tails off, starting in the morning to the end, and as Solomon asked God, Am I, in, does anybody even recognize my hard work? Does anybody care at the end of the day what I've done all day long? And I know us women kind of think that way sometimes too. And so in Ecclesiastics, we're going to study, are we doing what God wants us to do? Is our busyness being fruitful? Are we making a, a way to make different for the next generation? You bet we are, even in all our busyness. And, and God is pleased with it. So please come join us. We're going to meet back here at 6 o'clock in the next, not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday because our books didn't come in. So I invite all, all women, especially busy ones. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Well, as we said, man, we are delighted to have you join us for worship this morning. If you would, would you stand with me? We're going to go into a time of prayer, and then we are going to continue to worship our Lord and Savior this morning. Father God, thank you so much, Father, for today, for the, for the many blessings you've given us. God, thank you for the lives that have been changed this past week, Lord. Thank you so much for working in the hearts of our students, God. I pray that as we continue to go through this year, Father, I pray we can, you continue to work in the hearts of students, not just in our church, but across our city, across our country, across our world, Father, that more people, more students, more young people come to know you as their Lord and Savior. God, as we worship you this morning... God, I pray we come to you with open hearts. Father, as we sing your praises, prepare our hearts to hear your word. God, be with Bobby as he speaks this morning. Help us to learn something new. Help us to leave here uh, with something that helps us to apply, that we can apply better to our walk with you so that we can go to our places of work, our schools, uh, God, our homes, wherever we may go, and help us to have a kingdom impact in everything we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was 
chasing a high life, trying to satisfy my soul. All the lies I believed in, let me cry like the rain. And I saw that in heaven, and I did everything to say, I'm going to climb the mountain, I'm going to shout about Change the way you love me. Nothing can change. 
You can have a seat. So in light of a beginning of a brand new year, one of the things that we wanted to do to start off the year as, as a church family, to have the Lord's Supper together. And it's a great, I think it's a great way to start the year. It's a great reminder of what the Lord has done. And so what you're going to do, so let me just give you a couple of little things so you know, and then we'll get started into that. What we'll do is... Uh, if you are a Christian, you've accepted the Lord as your Lord and Savior, we don't, we're not really too concerned as far as actually where your membership resides as far as a church. But if you are a member of God's family, you are a Christian, you are a believer, we invite you to participate. You are more than welcome to sit out and go, I don't want to, maybe you don't feel comfortable doing that or whatever, and, and there's no judgment in that. We will not look down on you. Nobody's going to single you out if you decide for whatever reason that you don't want to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. But if you're a believer here, we welcome you to participate. We ask you to. We would love for you and be, consider it an honor for you to be a part of that with us this morning. And so even if this is your first time here uh, and you're a Christian, and we, just, we, uh, we would love for you to be a part of that with us. And so what we're going to do is we have two tables on each side and kind of split the hair right down the middle here. This side can go towards this table, this side can go towards this table, and you can just kind of go from right, uh, from left to right, basically, just go from here, and just go through there, and come back around to your seat. You just kind of walk through the end. And if you have somebody around you that maybe it would be difficult physically for them to get out, uh, feel free to, you know, get them whatever they, they may need as well. And what you're gonna see, I'm gonna go to this side, you're gonna see we have two cups and we kind of do that to make it easy. Sometimes they get a little sticky in here. You may have to do that. But what you're going to find, you have two cups. To the, back into the light. And one cup will have your juice, and one cup will have your cracker. So make sure that you reach deep and get both of the cups and don't grab just the top one because you may do that and leave behind something. So, um, but when you grab this, you can go back to your seat, and then we'll take them together. And so... Um, we're gonna, so while the band plays, here's what I'd love for you to do. When you come through, when you get back to your seat, just take a few moments to pause and to reflect while the music is still going and just to pray and reflect on what the Lord has done and how good he's been. And so at this time, we'll go ahead and have some people come to the tables here to help you. If you need any assistance, they'll certainly be there and be willing to help you. And so we'll go ahead and com continue with our service while the band plays. Go ahead and come through. So you guys come and you guys come.
The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it said, the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. In other words, remember me when you do this. And so let's just take a moment to have to pray. And what I want to do is I just want to give you just a few moments of silence to pray, to examine your heart, to think through what this means to you, um, what he did for you. And so I just want to give you that time to pray, and then I will pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you did. We thank you so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we thank you so much for what it means to us. And as we remember what you did, that your, that you, your body was broken, uh, that you were bruised for our sins, our transgressions, that you were crushed for our iniquities, but that your blood poured out for us fully, completely cleanses us of every sin. We put our trust in you, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that you have given up your life, that you stepped out of heaven onto earth to give us the ability to eat, to know you, to have eternal life, and to trust you as our heavenly Father. And so, Father, we pray that you will lead us now. We thank you for this, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as he said, this is my body which is for you, do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he said, this is the covenant of my blood for you whenever you drink it. And as we continue in worship, we just want to be, uh, continue in our, our love, our gratitude for the, our Heavenly Father for what he's done. And so as our band continues to lead us in worship.
your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we look into the sky, descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, oh Lord, unveil our eyes, your love is a dream, your I'm not sure how many times I can watch that without feeling the stress of that video. I know how many times you're going to have to watch it, but I tell you, sometimes I watch that and I just go, oh, it's just too much sometimes. So we're in a series that we started last week called Breathing Room. And kind of the idea is this, that we're hoping to get a little bit of breathing room, especially as we enter into 2023 and create maybe just some space in our lives. And so what I did last week is we started off showing you a picture and here's that picture I want to show it to you once again that picture now I'm just curious we'll ask it this week I didn't ask you this last week but how many did anybody raise their hand and say that's my closet you know anybody is anybody willing you know somebody creeps a finger up yeah there we go thank you yes somebody to raise their hand I mean it's church there's no judgment here this is fun and so how many of you I'm just curious Again, this, this may cause a hand to go up slower. How many of you look at that picture and you don't see a problem? Like you just kind of, oh, there we go, yes. There are those of you in the room who sit there. Some of you kind of went like this. You went, hey. 
you know, and so, and, and, and the kids, you were kind of looking at your parents going, can I admit this, you know, and so, so it's fun, it's interesting that we have these, these closets in our house, I mean, I have a closet like this too, and I have a room like this, you know, three or four closets that are just like this, but anyhow, you know, those, those places that you just don't go, and you don't really see a problem with it, and the thing about a closet is this, we're constantly adding stuff to it, but we're never really taking anything out, you know, because there's that thing, that little device or whatever that's in there that you've not needed for the last 20 years, but you grab it and you look at it and go, well, I might need this next week, so I'm going to... You hadn't needed it in 20 years, but you're going to keep it in there just in case, you know, because as soon as, as soon as you throw it away, you're going to go, oh, man, if I hadn't thrown that away. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we all kind of feel that. We have this, this clutter. We sometimes bring clutter into our lives that we, we constantly add to, but we rarely take things out. And this is perfectly fine for your closet. It's okay. If this is your closet, that's great. But the problem is, if this is our life, if this is a reflection of what our schedule looks like, where you're constantly adding things to your schedule, but you're never taking anything out of your schedule, and you're just go, 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 and you never stop, you never breathe, you never have a reset. Or our finances, if you're constantly adding expenses and adding expenses, but yet you're never removing, you're never eliminating, and you're finances begin to look like this it begins to become messy and what happens is we find ourselves in a place where we are extremely stressed all the time and that's all we can think about is all the things that we have to do all the things that we got to buy all the things that's going to cost us and we wind up having this clutter filled life and so we started a series and we defined breathing room last week as simply this breathing room is space between your current pace and your current limits that's what it is because here's the fact the fact is we're all better when we have some <sighs> breathing room we feel better when we have some space some margin some margin in our finances to where if there's some catastrophic thing that happens you're not like on the edge of bankruptcy all the time whenever it comes to our schedule it is nice to have a little breathing room so when something comes up you have some room in your schedule to make adjustments you have some room now here's what I love about our Heavenly Father and, and I just kind of get geeked out about this because there's just things about God that really excites me and this is one of them Did you realize that you have a Heavenly Father who loves you so much that he actually said hey I want you to take a day off isn't that great I mean you have a Heavenly Father who says I don't want you to work yourself to death I want you to have a day called Sabbath and I didn't create Sabbath for you to just not do anything I created Sabbath for your benefit see I, I created Sabbath so you would have a day of rest I didn't create you for the Sabbath I created the Sabbath for you like we sometimes get that backwards and we think that we were made for the Sabbath day and that's not true the Sabbath was created for us Jesus even said it himself I created the Sabbath for the benefit of you because I know that you need breathing room. I know that you need a break. Because if you continually go and you're always maxed out at your limits, you're stressed, you have tunnel vision, and you, eventually you get to a place of burnout where you stop enjoying the things that you used to love to do. I know a lot of pastors that do this. Uh, roughly 250 pastors leave the ministry, not for another job, they leave the ministry every month. Now, somebody put some statistic years ago, and it was like 1,700, some super inflated number, which is a bit crazy. But about 250, truthfully, end up leaving the ministry. And I know why. Because there's a temptation within all of us to keep the people around us happy. We want to be at absolutely everything, because people expect you to be at everything. And eventually, you have no breathing room, you're so worn out, and you get burned out, and you start hating the calling that God gave you and it happens all the time to people and so I know that I am better with breathing room I know that there are times throughout the week that I go places where I have no cell service so nobody can reach me because I need breathing room just like you because the temptation is to just add and add and add and add and take this and do that and do this and do that and never have any breathing room at all whatsoever so today 
we're going to talk about time, our time. We're going to kind of dive into this. And so here's some indicators that you might need to work on your schedule. Here's, here's, let me give you a few of them. If you find yourself constantly saying, I might be late. I might be about 15 minutes late. And how long does this thing last? Because I need to leave early. Like that's, that's your motto. Everybody knows you're going to come late and you're going to leave early. Like you're sitting there going, honey, when exactly are you going to be on stage? Because I want to come for that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to see those other kids. And I want to see those kids at the end. It's just you. And I got to get out of here because I got things to do. You're ramming around through traffic all the time, mad at everybody. Maybe showing pieces of your hand that you shouldn't show to the other motorists. I didn't know how nicely to say that. I felt like that was a real nice way. You're eating in your car. I mean, your car's a restaurant. Because you ain't got time to sit down and eat. Your car, like there's french fries all over the place in your car. When people get into your car, you got to throw stuff out of it. To, to, that way they can actually have a seat. Otherwise, they're sitting like this because their feet are, are on the McDonald's bags and all those other, other places. Maybe Chick-fil-A, but not around here. And you are constantly at this place where your kids are going, Mom, you're always on the phone. I'm, pay attention to me. I'm trying to talk to you. Dad's never home. Why are you never home? Why are you never here? Why are you always busy? Why, are, why, why is all this? And so the temptation for all of us is to constantly put stuff in to our schedule and never take anything out. And you and your kids are going 500 miles an hour in 500 different directions every day. And it never ends. And eventually you get to a point where you don't like it anymore. And your kids don't like it anymore. A great indicator for that is this. I see it all the time with teenagers. They graduate high school and they do not play athletics in college. Not because they couldn't have walked on somewhere, but because they were so sick of it. They didn't want to play. And so it's important for us to talk about this. And so here's the, here's the great thing. There is a guy in the Bible who gives us incredible, incredible insight on this. Like, I, I think this guy in the Bible knows a thing or two about our time and knows ways that we could spend our time that would give us some breathing. It's not to say that we don't do anything. We just sit around with our feet up. See, the Lord didn't say that either. Just sit around and not do anything ever. He just says, I want you to have some margin. I want you to have some space. I want you to focus on perhaps what matters most because you know what you know as well as I do, right? When you're real busy with your time and your finances and all this is going on and that's going on and this is going on, you miss out on what matters most to you, don't you? And that's the relationships and the time with people around you who matter the most to you. See, I, I know that. I know that about all of us because we don't have time sometimes because we're so busy and we miss out on the people around us. And so today we're going to talk, and here's the thing. I thought about it. I could have come up here and just give you some self-help thing to manage your time. And then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, they didn't come here for that. I mean, there are people who are way smarter than me who have written books. There are tons of books on it. They've written books and YouTube videos and training seminars, and you can go online and you can buy any of that stuff. And you, there's probably 500 different ideas out there on how you can manage your time, and only one of them is going to work for you. The rest of them are going to work for everybody else because they're different than you. And I thought, that's not why you came here. So I'm going to keep it simple, because I like simple. Simple is better. I just want to give you one big idea that could potentially change the way you think. And I think if it changed the way you think, you'll begin to change the way you live. And specifically, you'll be able to change what you do with your time and how you spend your time. To do that, we're going to look at a guy named Moses. Now, Moses lived 120 years. That's a little longer than any of us. Y'all think some of y'all out there going, well... I feel like I'm old, but you're not 120. No, you're not. I know it. I know you're not because the oldest man in Arkansas died, I think, this week, 115. So y'all ain't got any beat. You know, we're all, we're all young compared to Moses. And the Bible actually tells us that Moses, at 120 years old, had great eyesight. <laughs> Wouldn't you love that? Some of y'all are like me. You know, you cross over that 40 bridge, and you start doing like this. Somebody hands you something, like your kids hands you your phone. Here, look at that. And you're going, hmm, doing that. Going, you know, your arms aren't long enough anymore. 
we're all wearing glasses, you know, things like that. So I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still in my 40s and still doing that. But, and don't wear corrective lenses. But, but anyhow, you know, let's brag on that a little bit. But Moses had great eyesight. The first 40 years of Moses' life was great. So Moses was taken into the house of Pharaoh. He lives with Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter actually took him in, and they raised him up in this, this Egyptian palace, more or less. And everything's great. I mean, he's got a great life going for him. Until one day, he has a little disagreement with an Egyptian, and he kills the guy. He kind of buries him and runs for the hills. Everything was going fine until he killed a guy. You know how that goes, how that movie goes. And so he goes off into the wilderness. And out in the wilderness, he becomes a shepherd. And I'm going to tell you, being a shepherd, now that is a boring job. I mean, if you get a little excitement, a line comes up, it might be, but it's a boring job. I mean, I think sometimes I watch these How It's Made or different shows on TV, and these guys are in these factories, and they're just, they're just doing the part. And that's the only thing they do, that one part, and it goes down the line, and that part goes down the line, part goes down the line. And I think, I would go nuts if I had to do the same mundane task every day. Moses had to do it for 40 years. And so... 40 years, he's out there, and he's thinking. I'm sure this is what he's thinking. I don't know this, but this is what I'm thinking. For 40 years, Moses is out in the wilderness. He's going, well, I killed a guy, so I guess this is just going to be the way it's going to be. You know, when you're 80, you're kind of thinking, maybe I'll get a break here. Nope. Not Moses. You know, he just worked right on through retirement. And then he's out there one day, and he sees this burning bush. At 80, sees this burning bush that says, oh, Moses, I want you to go do something now. I'm like, 40 years, and you want me to go do something? I'm, I'm 80 now? And so he sends him to Pharaoh, the house where he grew up. And he says, I want you to lead my people out. And so Moses makes a bunch of excuses. You can go back and read all about it. It's all in Exodus. It's so interesting. I love how Moses has a conversation and an argument with God, you know, like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Anyhow, Moses goes. He, the, all the plagues happen. Eventually, the Pharaoh gives up and says, take your people and get out of here. So now Moses has gone from being this little shepherd for 40 years to he's leading a million people out into the wilderness. And they go to this place. They get the Ten Commandments and multiple other commandments, not just the Ten Commandments. We sometimes think that's all they got, but that's not true. Got a bunch of commandments that day. And that's where we got the Sabbath, by the way. We got that one there. But anyhow, so Moses is out in the wilderness well, then they get a little bit of rebellion. So he's out there with about a million plus people. And you know what they're doing? They're walking in circles in the wilderness, basically. And all the people are griping and complaining. Now, a million people complaining. Sounds like politics. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, kidding, kidding. But anyway, a million plus people just complaining, just complaining. Rah, 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 rah. You imagine having to hear a bunch of people for 40 years just gripe and complain? Just gripe. Just complain, gripe, complain, 40 years. I mean, none of us are 110. You think at 110, you'd be like, oh, Lord, I'm about tired of hearing these folks, okay? I mean, for 40 years, he's out there. And they get up to the edge of the promised land, all right? The edge of the promised land. And God goes, hey, look over there. There's the promised land. Good thing you can still see good at 120 years because you're not going in there. What? After dealing with all of this? I don't get to go in, I don't get to lead the people into the promised land. I don't get to enjoy the fruit of my labor. I don't get to see any results. I have to stand here with good eyesight at 20 years old, 120 years old and die. Isn't that nice? So you think you got some sorrows, poor Moses. Now you would think I would take you to Exodus, maybe Deuteronomy or somewhere to talk about the life of Moses, but I'm not. We're going to go to Psalm chapter 90. And you think, Moses wrote a psalm? Yes, he did. Psalm chapter 90. And I think Moses gives us some wisdom of how to spend our time, how to spend our days. Because Moses lived a long life, but Moses also dealt with a lot of stuff along the way. So here we go. Now, he gets a little bit, oh, you know, negative Nancy-ish first. You know, we'll start off there. It'll be all right. We'll get through. Ex uh, Mo uh, uh, Moses. Psalm chapter 90, verse 1, it says, Lord... You have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Now, he's talking about the nation of Israel. They've been the, God's, God has been their dwelling place. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole 
world. In other words, Moses is a creationist. He believes that God created everything. And before anything was ever formed, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's a big statement. That statement, I love that statement. You're God. You turn people back to dust and return to dust, you mortals. That's interesting, isn't it? That's not meant to be offensive. I'm not telling you that to be offensive, but it's basically saying this. Here's the way to say it. That God controls the beginning and the ending of our lives. Here's here's my guess. I'm going to take a wild guess. I believe that probably all of you believe that God controls the beginning and the ending of your life. Let me prove it to you. All right, you ready? Here's how I believe it. If you went to the doctor tomorrow and you got a terminal diagnosis, and they said you are not going to make it, would you pray? Hmm, why would you pray? Because you believe that God controls the beginning and the ending of your life. You believe that everlasting to everlasting has some sort of power, and he has the power to do something to make a doctor or a team of doctors absolutely wrong you believe that he has the power if it were you not only that you believe it for other people because if somebody you loved had a bad traumatic accident heaven forbid had a bad traumatic accident you would pray and not only that you would ask other people to join in with you to pray we actually saw this week that a nation actually believes that God controls the beginning and the ending of their life because multiple people who probably have not prayed for a long time, I'm just assuming this, I don't know this to be a fact, prayed earlier this week for a football player as he went down in cardiac arrest. And as he's having a, car, a, a significant cardiac event, a nation was praying. A bunch of people. Interesting, isn't it? We believe that God controls the beginning and the ending and the days of our life. And that's absolute proof of that. Just by our behavior, maybe not with our words, but by our behavior, we just proved that we believe that. Continues on. He says, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Or a watch, a watch in the night is about three hours. A watch in the night. Now, we know that God is outside of time. He's not bound by our clock, that ticking clock that I'm looking at, just watching it click, 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 time away, and it's just counting down. God's not bound by any of that. I mean, God is is totally outside of time. Now, think about this. This will make you feel real good this morning. That a thousand years to God, it's like three hours. So how long is your life to God? It kind of makes you question, doesn't it? Now, it's interesting, and it's what I love about the Lord, is that he said that also in the New Testament says, a thousand years like a day, a day is like a thousand years, which tells me that our days in, of our life is like that right there to God, but also, at the same time, God is so intimately connected with the details of our life that a day can be as long as a thousand years to the Lord, that God is not bound by time, but our life is just a, a mist in the air. It says, verse 5, he says, yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death and they are the new like the new grass in the morning and in the morning it springs up but by evening it is dry and withered away I mean from God's perspective our lives are like that big now I know what you're thinking I would usually preach good sermons but this one here is not going so well I'm not enjoying it as much because you're just kind of like Debbie Down or negative Nancy, you know, whatever other kind of words you want to throw in. I hope there's no Nancys or Debbies in here. If there is, I'm not talking about you, I promise. But here's the thing. This right here, I think, puts our time in perspective because we function and we live our lives like we think we have unlimited time. We think that we have just all the time that's absolutely possible. But yet, the interesting thing about time is we all have the same amount every week. We all have the same amount of hours today. None of us get any more. And it goes the same amount of time. I mean, it clicks by at the same pace for every single one of us. And so, 
Verse 10, it's a little more negative. Our days may come to 70 or 80 years if, if our strength endures. This is a 120-year-old man saying that. Yet the best of them, like the best days of your life, are but trouble and sorrow. Now you think about Moses, and you think about your troubles and your sorrows, and you think about Moses, 120 years. I mean, I don't want to, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't want to live 120 years. I have no desire. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. I mean, I just don't. I mean, you just have, somebody was going, you may think differently when, you're, when you know, your age is doubled and you're in your 80s. And, and you may be right, but I don't think so. You know, I mean, I just think, mm. And you look at this, and, and Moses goes, your days are full of trouble and sorrow. I mean, we think about our days as full of trouble and sorrow. Now look at Moses and having to deal with a million plus people complaining all the time. It's difficult enough to listen to two or three. Moses had millions of them just whining and complaining. And it got to a point where God even sat there and said, I'm just going to wipe them all off the planet. These people are ridiculous. And Moses goes, no, 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 don't do that. And I'm thinking, how? Why wouldn't he just sit there and go, I'll try, I won't see, I won't look. Just knock them out. Be done with them. You know, at least get the, get the whiniest of them off of here. I mean, I can just imagine. You just imagine that Moses is looking at this. I mean, Moses goes from being in Pharaoh's palace to being a shepherd. And then he goes from zero to hero when he leads all these people out into the wilderness, only to circle back around and look at this nice little promised land that God's been saying you're going to get and be told, you ain't going. They got this young guy over here. He's going to lead them into the promised land. It's like, what? How is this, how is this even right? He continues. He tells us, it's like, all these days, these troublesome days, they, they quickly pass. We fly away. Here's the point. Time and life goes by quickly. And then he says something, and I think here's, here's where we start getting to the point. Here's where we start getting to the place where the big idea lives. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is great as the fear that is due. This is hard to translate. Now, this sounds like a great fire and brimstone moment where we could just start dropping the gauntlet down on you about God's wrath, you know, because I mean, people love God's wrath, you know, certain, especially certain denominations, they really love talking about it. But here's what really the meaning kind of comes down to. If we could see God for who he really is, then we would give him the reverence that he's due. In other words, if we began to see God for who he really is, that would begin to affect and change how we spend our limited time. And so he gives us some wisdom. In light of the fact that your days are short, you're not here forever, he gives us some wisdom, and here it is. Teach us to number our days. You ever numbered your days? You ever had an exam due, big exam? And you had a deadline? You ever had a deadline on something? You got an assignment due? You got a presentation at work or something that you got to do? I mean, I'm on a deadline every, every Sunday. I mean, you know, Sunday. Somebody told me when I first got into the ministry, they said, preaching is like this. It's like being pregnant all week, giving birth on Sunday, and only to wake up Monday and realize you're pregnant again. I mean, that's pretty much how it was told to me, and I was like, that's about true. I mean, you're always under a deadline. Days are numbered. You know, so this, this means something to me. Have you ever had a, something to do? You know what you do? If you're like me, you wait till the night before, but you count down the days when something is due. Like when I'd have papers due in college, I would count down the days. And I had them due in seminary, man. I was counting down the days going, I've got three more days to get this done. You know what I want to do? I'm going to pull an, all, an all-nighter the night before. I'll get it done, and I'll get it to the professor's office by 7 o'clock in the morning. And I would. I would. I don't know how I got through, but I got through. And so teach us to number our days so we don't function as though we have unlimited time. Listen, your kids are not going to be at home forever. You've got to maximize your time now because they are not going to be at home forever. You've got to make sure that you maximize your time and your relationship with them because one of these days, they will be gone. You are not going to be here forever. If you're 15 and here or 14 or whatever, 8, and you think you've got all the time in the world, you're not going to be here forever. So teach us to number our days. I don't know how many days you'll be here, nor do I know how many. I don't have a glass bottle. I mean, all I got is a bottle of water. I don't have anything to tell you how long. All I got to tell you is teach us to number our days. 
And why would we do that? Well, because of this reason, that we may gain a heart of wisdom, that we may get some wisdom out of this. Teach us to number our days. In other words, help me to remember. It's a simple way I remember it. Teach me to remember that my time is limited. So that limits how I spend my time. My time is limited every week. My time is limited every day. So that limits how I spend my time. So there was a lady, her name is Bronnie Ware, and she ended up writing a book on this, but she was a lady who would spend the last 12 weeks with people before they died. And she come up with a list of five top regrets that she noticed that people on their deathbed who were very alert and oriented would often tell her. And so what I did was I took, I'm going to grab two of them. You can read the book if you would like to. Bronnie Ware is her name. Bronnie, not Bonnie. And anyhow, so you can read some of these requests. But what we're going to do is this. We're going to flash forward to the end of our lives. And we're going to gain a little bit of insight and a little bit of wisdom. You're welcome. I'm going to give that to you. So, so she gave us two top regrets that she had. Here was the second regret on the list. It says, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. In other words, I wish I hadn't spent so much time focused on work. And I would have spent a little more time with the people around me that I love the most. Now... From her perspective, she said mostly male patients would say this, but we live in a time now where that's not the case. It's going to maybe, this, when she did this, that was true because she's dealing with a generation before now. But I think in the future, it's not going to be male, female. It's going to be, I just wish I hadn't worked so hard. And we can learn from that and spend time, more quality time with one another. So that's the second one. The number one regret, and listen, if you are a teenager, I hope that you suck this in and get it. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. I mean, that right there. I wish I would have lived true to myself. I, I, I wish I would have done what I wanted to do, not what everybody else expected. Here's, here's the ending. I know there's some, there's, some, there's some pushback that you're tempted to say, uh, you know, I don't know about that, but here, here, let me just show you this. I got a list of just some questions or some things I want to say. If I don't do as much as possible, I'll never make it. Make it? What is it? Or I will fall behind. Fall behind who? Why are you concerned about that? Well, I'll be poor. What? What, is that? what does that have to do with anything? Taking a day off. I won't be accepted. By who? By what? I won't measure up. To whose standard are you trying to measure up? And so in light of our time and in light that our days are numbered, what I did was this. Out there on the back table, you have a card. And it looks kind of like this slide. Actually, we had the slide for it so you can see it before you get it. If you didn't get this, I want to ask you to get it. Because on this card, you'll see what are some things that you could add to maximize your time. What are some, what's something you could add? Maybe, maybe you should say, well, I'd, I'd really like to start my day off with prayer in 2023, with God's Word in 2023, so I can, I can grow in my love and understanding of the Lord. Like, I, that's how I want to I start. I want to add that. But there's some things I need to take away, some things that are sucking the life out of me, some things that I don't enjoy anymore, some things that just expectations of other people, I'm sick of it. And so these are some things that I'm going to begin to take out of the closet because I don't want my schedule and my time to look like the closet. I want some breathing room. So I am going to take some things away and maybe some things that you need to do less Maybe some things you need to do more of. And so I encourage you to take this, write some down. This is just for you. This isn't for, you know, we don't need you to turn it in. This is just for you. And begin to think through what are some things this week, this is your homework, this week, that you can begin to add to, take away, have a little less of, and a little more of. As we continue the series, and what I think will happen for all of us is we can begin to declutter, and we can begin to have a life with a little more breathing room. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you teach us and tell us, and we thank you for your love and grace and goodness. 
And we pray and ask that you will lead us now as we go through our day. Lead us as we want to know you more and lead us to be people who serve you, who honor you, who trust you with our time, who surrender to you our time. We know our days are numbered. And so we surrender our days to you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you for being here. If you're a guest, again, certainly we are so glad that you are here. And you guys have a great Sunday, and we will see you next week. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of us shall gather over on the other shore, and the